Hello, uh, thank you for joining me. Um, this video is going to be looking at um, the relationship between ontology and epistemology and how it informs our rules for science. Um, in last week's video, I discussed the research tree, gave an overview of what we're doing the continuing videos that will be posted each week in the beginning of each week, um, Tuesdays in Eastern Central Time, uh, Eastern or Central Time, will be on uh, the content of various aspects within that research tree. Um, whether we're talking about ontology or epistemology or methodology or methods or tools, which are your main branches of that tree or the roadmap of how we're going to do our research. Um, we're really going to start with ontology. Ontology is the core belief of whatever it is that you believe. Okay. And those are your core system of beliefs that we all have. And when somebody says, I believe that this thing exists, they're talking about the ontology. In research, it also creates our assumptions. So I'm going to make certain assumptions when I write a research paper or when I evaluate a research paper. Those assumptions come from a combination of the ontology and the epistemology which is how do we know what something is? If somebody tells you that they are a constructivist or a cognitivist um, or they're holistic, right? Those are epistemological points of view. Their beliefs themselves is something else. And it's important as a researcher that we understand, and as a scientist too, that we understand the difference between what a point of view is, how do we know what something is, and what our core beliefs are. So as a kind of a fun way to kind of visualize how this works, um, let's create a circle down here for ontology and let's create another circle down here for epistemology. And there's a relationship between them. So as an example, I believe that the Earth is round. I believe this because we have all of this evidence that is in pictures and photographs and testimony of scientists that has followed um, sound methodological premises that the Earth is round, dating all the way back to about 500 BC, I believe. I'll put a link below um, where it was first decided by, I believe, Pythagoras and then later by Aristotle. Mathematically, we could measure the Earth from the sun um, and know by shadows that the Earth is round. If I believe that the Earth is flat, then I'm rejecting all of that evidence. And there should be, at least if I want to position myself as a credible researcher, there should be something there that says that the tests were conducted wrong, the math is not correct, that there is something other than I don't like the idea, right? It is true that at that time um, there was this idea that the earth uh, was circled by the sun, that the sun orbited the earth. Later on, math rejected that as well. Now let's go to a slightly more contentious topic in some areas. I also believe 
and climate change. I believe this because of the scientific evidence that we can take measurements of ice sheets, we can take measurements of uh, change in temperature of the earth, that we can look at how um, certain areas are being hit by more storms or have more water or less water. We can look at atmospheric changes that are occurring, that the makeup of the atmosphere is a little bit different. And that's again not by any one agency. There's multiple agencies with multiple scientists that have formed a consensus. So that is why I believe in climate change because of this relationship between what is a core belief and how do we know what that core belief is. To reject climate change, you have to reject all of those rules and all of that evidence and all of that math and say all those scientists are wrong. Now that can be done but it usually introduces a whole new culprit inside this particular relationship. That culprit um, is the baggage that we carry, our biases. You cannot form a scientific theory that does not link the ontology and the, and the epistemology. That if I do not believe in climate change, right? There has to be a reason that I do not believe in climate change other than say economics. Economics doesn't link correctly to this. It's a non sequitur or a logical fallacy. Um, later on in this video series, I'll talk about logical fallacies. Um, we all have them. We all tend to employ them. We do that to confirm that the bias that we share, or that we have at least, but we may share with other people, is somehow correct. Um, it is very difficult to reject climate science unless you're rejecting all of that science. Now sometimes people will go and they'll find authorities. Maybe they'll find a doctor in business who talks about climate science is not real. That's okay. However, <laughs> are they climate scientists, right? If I go to a medical doctor I'm looking for something like an MD. I want somebody who practices medicine. I don't go for um, my uh, medical issues to a um, physicist. It's not that the physicist isn't smart. It's not that they may not even have an answer. But that isn't their area of specialty. And so one of the things when we talk about evidence, and we'll get into the rules of evidence and science a little bit later in a different video, we want to look at experts in the field. When I go and say, I need to know how to uh, present on uh, students to be able to do homework correctly, or I need to know what is the difference between homework and studying, I'm looking for fancy letters after their name that is in the education field. They may be still doctors, maybe they're even medical doctors. Maybe they're medical doctors that are teaching. They have to somehow be an authority on the subject rather than say a business person that is telling us no matter how smart they are or how successful they are something that we do not want to believe. This is where research can go really wrong. Um, I'm going to have to talk about evidence rules. I just had a conversation um, last week um, at work with a student who did not understand how you would be able to fact check or how you would know if a person was an authority or how you would know 
if something was true and about facts. This is the foundation of our facts. What do I believe? Why do I believe it? Now, we have to kind of connect with a few other things up here. I'm going to separate between what's up on the screen here and what's down below. So I'm just going to put that line there. And we need to talk about this gradiated scale between realism and anti-realism. Anti-realism is not a rejection of reality. Right. Realism is not that this is a real world that we are in. That's not what those two terms exactly mean. We could use a different set of terms and call realism is objective facts that we all share and we all live in that same shared set of objective facts. Anti-realism is the idea that we create our reality based on our perceptions. And there is a lot of scale in between this. So let's just put some lines there to show the different scales of what's going on between those two. Um, somewhere in that scale is reductionism. I'll talk about reductionism. I have a whole video on it. It's fascinating to me. Um, but reductionism is basically taking any field of science and reducing it to its most component pieces. And modern day physics, for the most part, actually follows reductionism now rather than the objective reality that we followed with Newtonian physics for so long. Um, and the culprit is quantum mechanics that kind of screwed all that up. Now we got to get some lines to, to connect this relationship that we have going on to what's going on up here in our ontology. So we'll just put on these lines there. Um, we want to be able to look into and understand what's going on in that relationship. So let's add the windows and it's your belief. So you're the truck driver. And then we'll just name for completeness. You're on your road of life mm -hmm. or a street, I guess, in this case. I did write this. I should really know that. Um, this is important because when we start looking at our ontology and epistemology, a word that gets thrown around a lot, sometimes not quite correctly, is theory. We have a theory about how um, or what something is. A theory is a supposition of fact. I can't prove it. But based on other evidence that I have and other things that I know, I can make an informed theory. There's different versions and um, definitions of theory out there. I am specifically talking about theory in the sciences used for research. A theory is not really a wild guess. A theory is based on some sort of knowledge that I have that is credible and follows rules of evidence. And I'm saying now that based on that, I can use and say that this is a fact. So let's take a different example. Let's look at uh, in the quantum world, if you're not familiar, there are different particles, and we've been able to find particles for um, the strong nuclear force or the weak nuclear force, but we have not been able to find a particle for that missing block of gravity. Quantum math suggests that there should be a particle that exerts a force of attraction. Right? We even have a name for that particle called the graviton. How do I know that that theory might be correct? I can look at quantum math, 
which, by the way, I do not understand. Mm -hmm. But I can look at credible sources of people who do understand quantum map and say that, well, that quantum should exist. Or perhaps I don't believe that there's a graviton particle. That is a perfectly valid theory too, because Newtonian physics are based on observation. What we observe, what we see, what we can measure, is real. I can't see it. I haven't found it. Maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe I'm looking for something in the graviton that is not there. Remember I said that over here in subjective and anti-realism, there's this idea that um, your perception changes the world around you. We used to follow in science and specifically in research a more objective frame. The idea that what we can uh, observe, what we can measure is real. Quantum physics messed that up because in quantum physics when you measure something you change the experiment. So I can't measure time and position at the same time in quantum physics. I can only measure one because the very act of watching one of those and measuring one of those changes the other one. And that means my perception has created a slightly different reality, if you wish. Um, those experiments are called the black body experiments. I'll post a, um, a couple of sources below for people who want further reading. There's also an excellent video by uh, Joe Scott where he covers um, the black body experiments and what they are, and they can get kind of weird because they're not, uh, they don't follow what we usually think of as in Newtonian physics. So I can have a core belief, but I have to have some idea of what that something is. Why do I believe that? And then I create a theory from that on something, this is what I believe to be true based on this. And when students begin doing research, um, that's what they start with. Those dissertations that people do, that starts with a theory. A theory in research should be informed. It's not really a wild guess based on nothing. And that's why when you read a dissertation or a science uh, academic paper um, that was published in a peer-reviewed journal, you're going to see a whole block of information called the literature review. And that is all of the various people who are credible on that, that that person has found and believes is relevant, is informing this person's now theory. And from that theory, we're going to generate further questions, hypotheses, which become research questions. Um, let's just separate theory and supposition of fact up there. By the way, this idea of a theory has to be linked over to here too, right? This is all linked information. When a enough people in that field um, and that is usually the majority of people in the field believe something, whether it is theory or if they've decided that it is fact, it is provable and measurable. Then we have a paradigm. A paradigm is an idea that a consensus has. So as an example, um, of a paradigm. I talked about earlier that in the Middle Ages or in Greece there was the belief that the Sun orbited the Earth. 
we now know that is not true. We know it both mathematically and we know it visually. We can measure it, we can see it, we can test it. A consensus of scientists in that field have agreed. Now there may be other people that don't agree. That's fine. That doesn't mean it's not true. And as a researcher, one of the things that I listen to and that we have to listen to is when somebody says, well, we don't know that isn't true. And I answer, yes, that is correct, because we cannot prove a negative. I can't prove something that doesn't exist. And so when I'm talking to a person about climate science, for instance, or the earth being round, um, or about the fact that we cannot travel faster than the speed of light, I can't prove the idea of, well, we don't know that that doesn't exist. We just haven't found something that allows us to pass the speed of light. When somebody tells me that I, I just feel like this because you, I can't, I can't really explain it, but you haven't proven. We haven't found any evidence that says it is not. They're talking about this. That's your baggage. That's the baggage that we pull along with us. These are our biases that we have. They may be um, a life orientation. They may be political. They may be economical. Um, they may be pretty much anything. And this baggage that they have sometimes causes a problem both in the correct linkage of the relationship that they're not saying, I don't know something exists because of a valid rule of evidence. As an example, um, video games. Um, video games were thought at one point to be very violent and that they would cause violent behaviors. Later, as uh, scientists in the field began looking at this, they found that maybe the question of the math or maybe the way that the group was put together, um, the subset of people that were tested, perhaps that was not calculated correctly. And in fact, in video games, um, some of the early papers on it were, were based on subsets of people who were in uh, medical institutions and sometimes psychiatric institutions because those were the people that were available to be tested on. And to the credit of those scientists, very rarely, in fact, I can't think offhand of a scientist who said that that particular study of these people can be generalized into the main population. Um, and so therefore, it's other people who read it and said, oh, 20% or 50% or 80% of the people who played this in this group had this reaction, therefore I guess we all have it. That's not how science works. Now, accepting the silly little drawing here of a truck, right? we can release, remove pretty much all of this because this is really based on your ontology and your epistemology and the relationship between them. However, what can bend that relationship and make it so that it's no longer credible research 
is that baggage that we have, those biases. And so in academics, the difference, one, well, there's many, but one of the differences between personal research and academic research has to do with how we treat that baggage. In academic research, um, scientists and researchers are encouraged to remove that baggage, wipe it out. In personal research, you can have that baggage. And when somebody says, you know, I'm really interested, I'm going to find out for myself. And they go on various sites and they look to confirm their bias that they have. That does not offend me, it doesn't particularly bother me. It's for their own personal enlightenment and edification. I'm fine with that. I think anytime anybody is learning anything, it's great. It is not, however, academic research and it is not credible research from the viewpoint that um, it can be uh, disseminated in a way that is saying that this is fact. We have to reject that bias. That doesn't mean that I will like it. I might find something that I do not like when I'm doing that research. I still have to accept it, I have to acknowledge it, I have to look at it and say, is there a way that this was calculated differently? Is there a way that the group of people um, that the experiment used, I have tend to be in social research, which is why I talk about groups of people um, being in education, or a way that um, a group of objects, if you're in the more physical sciences. Maybe that chemical reaction um, was done incorrectly because they measured something incorrectly or they used the wrong type of chemical. So when we're looking at the relationship between this, these are where our assumptions come from in research. And we really have to be careful that we're not letting our baggage that we carry into this uh, causes problems. Now on Thursday, I'm going to post a question and answer, um, not only from this video, but from some questions that have arisen in past videos, or a couple of questions that have just come out about research that I haven't really gotten to yet. Um, and then next week, I want to be looking at uh, two things. I have a goal to introduce to you the research cat by which this channel gets its name. Um, and I also want to have move away from the diagrams for a little bit and um, talk with you in a more personal setting um, about um, why research is so important to me and also what sort of things that we're looking at as researchers, particularly in education that happens to be um, uh, my expertise, but what researchers do, because sometimes I, uh, I'll separate between a researcher and a scientist, and sometimes they're the same, but not always. And I think of myself more as a researcher than I think of myself as a scientist Although I have conducted studies and I have a license to conduct human research, so at times I can step into the role of science. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then if you have any feedback onto where the channel was going or what you like or what you would like to see more of, um, that's fine, just put it down below. If you want to give me a thumbs up, that's great because then I know that people watch the video um, and that they liked what they saw. Or if you didn't like it, you can do a thumbs down. Um, so that's, your, that's the uh, particular presentation for this time. Thank you for watching, and I uh, hope to see you on Thursday, or rather I should say that you'll see me on Thursday or next week. Take care.